Okay. Um, the this disease that has erupted at uh, UCT. I mean, they have had problems with transformation for a number mm. of years. Mm. Have you witnessed a similar thing at Rhodes? I mean, how's their transformation um, process been there? It has and been. And at the universities, it by has extension. Been quite a slow process. I, I think under Dr. Salim Badat, the previous vice chancellor, s uh, serious efforts were made to pursue a transformation agenda mm. to attract more black staff, um, particularly young black staff because the, the, the feeling is this is the way to go mm. and I, I was very lucky in the history department when I retired at the end of 2012 it was decided that my post should be converted into two lectureships and those two lectureships are held by outstanding young black women mm. both with PhDs <coughs> um, both excellent uh, historians and, and, and teachers but it is a slow process um, I think it's sometimes difficult to attract uh, black academics t to mm. a town like Grahamstown, which is a small town, as you know. So, Prof, is it more from the, st uh, the staff <coughs> perspective or, or the student, the makeup of the student demographic? Uh, the student demographic has, has changed quite significantly. I think the numbers are now about 64% black black in the wider sense of the term, mm. black in the black consciousness sense of the term. But I was interviewed by Drum Magazine a couple of days ago and I was asked this question, how has Rhodes transformed? And the questioner mm. said, don't tell me that the student demographic has changed. I want to know how the university has changed in other ways. Mm. So it's already got beyond that. And other people say it's not just too about the staff demographic, it's about the whole institutional mm. culture. And a lot of black academics come to UCT, to Rhodes, Spitz, and find the whole culture of the place very alienating, very mm. European, very Western, mm. with its graduation ceremonies. But at the same time, uh, I go to all the graduation ceremonies, and there's a widespread turnout, and everybody, black and white, comes to graduation. I don't know if you, <laughs> you did. Um, and people dress up and take mm. it very seriously. I, I don't get a sense that people are necessarily, students are necessarily alienated by the ceremony. I mm. think they enjoy it. Mm. <laughs> what, what, what do you say to, I guess, the purists who argue that many of these institutions wouldn't be here were it not for these colonial figures like Cecil Rhodes? Yeah, that, 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 that is a difficult one to answer. Uh, indeed, it was a Rhodes University would not have existed, I don't mm. think, without money coming from Cecil Rhodes. Mm. It's interesting that Rhodes died in 1902, 113 years ago yesterday. <laughs> uh, and a small group of people in Grahamstown were wanting to establish a new university. And their first idea was to call it Eastern Province University mm. College. And then a few days later, they changed their mind and said, well, why don't we call it Rhodes University College? Approach the Rhodes Trust in Oxford for mm. some money, believing that the name would uh, be a good bargaining mm. chip to, to obtain the money. And it worked. The Rhodes Trust gave 50,000 pounds to establish the first four chairs at Rhodes University mm. in 1904. And I don't think they would have raised sufficient funds without that to get the university off the ground. But who knows, maybe later on uh, a university might have been established. But it's interesting that Cecil Rhodes himself had wanted to establish a university on his Scrutoscuro estate in the 1890s. Mm. And that, that fell through. But if it had been established, I'm quite sure Rhodes University would have been here in Cape Town. And they would have had the additional problem of the name. Mm. And if we'd had a university in Grahamstown, we wouldn't have had that problem. Because Rhodes had actually no connection with Grahamstown at all. His roots were in Cape Town and Kimberley. Mm. So, Prof, uh, final question. The situation mm. at, at UCT, I mean, the mm. Rose Must Fall campaign, um, mm. it, yeah, it's garnered a lot of support. It's backed by the SRC. Mm. I believe they, they're due to meet in only about four weeks' time, mm. um, you know, with the various uh, interested parties. Mm. Um, students are not happy about that. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, how do you see this, this situation playing out? It's difficult. I'm not entirely familiar with what's happened at UCT. Uh, I know there is a student sit-in in, mm -hmm. the, in, the, in the Bremner building that's being occupied by students. I believe they are demanding that a date be fixed for the removal of the statue. Mm -hmm. 
which I think, I think it's got a bit unfortunate because it, m my understanding is that it is the intention of management to have the statue removed. That has mm. been a statement of the Vice-Chancellor, Max mm. Price. And I believe, I believe he doesn't want it destroyed, just relocated. Yeah, I don't think anybody know. wants it destroyed. I, as far as I know, the students aren't for, ca calling for it to be destroyed. Mm. Uh, I hope they're not. I, I believe they want it relocated. Okay. And there's to be a council meeting, I think, in two weeks' time. And, and Max Price is saying that this is really a decision for, for council. Uh, he himself can't mm. arbitrarily make such a decision mm. to have the statue removed, which seems to me to be fair enough. So I think the sit-in is, is, a, is a matter that's got beyond the, the statue. It's mm. much more about more fundamental issues of transformation. Mm. But then, by extension, would uh, statues of, of, of all, all the other sort of colonial figures around Southern Africa then... I mean, would this, would this be a domino effect? Do you see It's this? quite likely, yes. Mm. I was just reading a couple of minutes ago in the Cape, today's Cape Times, before you came, that the statue of King George V at UKZN, on the UKZN campus, mm. that was covered with white paint yesterday. Mm. So, yes. And I, I would say to that that um, statues, colonial statues or any statue, should not be fixed. Heritage has to be fluid. Mm. And so any kind of colonial heritage statues should always be subject to re-examination, reconceptualization, and possible relocation. And I don't like um, throwing paint, and I, I, I would certainly would not condone throwing excrement over a, a statue. But one thing mm. I think that shows utter disregard for the people, the dignity of the people mm. who have to clear it up. That's why I object strongly to that. But these uh, statues should not just remain standing unquestioned. I think there are lots of creative, constructive, critical things that you can do with colonial statues, but not just deface them, destroy mm. them.